Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Satloff, the Executive Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special event, a conversation with the Foreign Minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Prince Faisal bin Farhan El Saud. Before we begin, just a couple of logistical notes. First, I urge everyone to take advantage of the expertise and analysis of my colleagues at the Washington Institute on the many issues that we'll be discussing today. So please, after the event, please go to www.washingtoninstitute.org for incisive and insightful analysis on Saudi politics, energy, Gulf politics, and everything related to U.S. Middle East policy. Secondly, if you have questions that you would like to filter into our conversation today, please feel free to send them to me directly at my email address, rsatloff, R-S-A-T-L-O-F-F, -F, at washingtoninstitute.org. And I'll do my best to bring all these questions into our conversation. With that, I'm delighted to welcome our guest, uh, Prince Faisal. Uh, Prince Faisal is, is marking his uh, first anniversary as foreign minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia this month. Previously, he served as the Saudi ambassador to Germany, uh, prior to which he was posted here in Washington as an advisor at the Saudi embassy. Um, I understand, Prince Faisal, that you're here in Washington to launch the U.S.-Saudi strategic dialogue. Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over to you for some opening remarks, after which I'm um, eager to have a conversation. Um, His Excellency, Prince Faisal. Well, thank you very much, Rob, and I want to thank uh, the Washington Institute for this opportunity. Uh, during this time of uncertainty, as the international community continues to focus on combating, controlling, and overcoming the COVID-19 pandemic, our bilateral and global partnerships are more important than ever. One way we continue the effectiveness of our bilateral cooperation is the Saudi strategic dialogue, which is yet another important contribution to our partnership that began 75 years ago with the historic meeting between President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and King Abdulaziz al-Saud in 1945. The strategic dialogue allows our nations to constructively discuss the wide range of issues of strategic importance to both nations, maintain our robust institutional cooperation, and advance the extensive security, economic, and person-to-person -person bonds that underpin our partnership. Saudi Arabia is president of the G20 this year and the host of the next month's G20 summit, now virtual given the circumstances that we are all having to deal with. Like so much of our interactions and meetings, but nonetheless a critical gathering. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, the kingdom has kept the work of the G20 focused on addressing the global crisis. In March, King Salman chaired the first ever virtual meeting of the G20 in order to coordinate a global health and economic response to the pandemic and to make sure the resources required to pursue the development of therapeutics and vaccines were available. And during next month's G20 summit, we will keep the focus on the pandemic, not just for the health and safety of the G20 nations, but as King Salman said in March, when convening the G20 leaders, also out of responsibility to extend a helping hand to developing countries and less developed countries so that they can build their capacities and improve their infrastructure to, uh, to overcome the crisis. Progress has been made. Together, the G20 has committed more than $21 billion to combat the virus through vaccine development and therapeutics and more than $11 trillion in stimulus money to restore the global economy. We are truly all in it together. The challenge in front of us is a shared global challenge. While COVID has forced us to social distance and at times to nationally isolate, our pathway through the global emergency is our collaboration. And when we get through this, when we reopen our nations confidently and return to some form of normalcy, it will be because we work together, because we did this together. That's why partnerships matter, why strong bilateral relationships are so important, like the long-standing, enduring friendship between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United States of America. This year, we commemorated the 75th anniversary of the meeting between Saudi King Abdulaziz and US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the meeting that laid the foundation for this partnership, a relationship that has been beneficial not just for both nations, but the world. Together, we defeated communism. Together, we all but eliminated the threat of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And together, we continue to combat terrorism and extremism by going after the men the money and the mindset that foments violent extremism. But that is not all. 
Our collaboration has contributed enormously to regional stability and development, as well as global economic prosperity, and it continues to do so. Yes, there have been some turbulent waters in our relationship, some crosswinds to navigate, but most importantly, our two nations always find a way forward because our work together is too important to our nations and to the world. When we work together, we build, we build a better, safer world. Our region has, been more than its, has seen more than its share of chaos and uncertainty. It has experienced decades of tension and conflict, seen legitimate governments undermined and destabilized. In places like Syria, millions of innocent men, women, and children have been victimized and terrorized, deprived of the most basic human necessities. But it does not have to be that way. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia maintains a foreign policy agenda committed to the political resolution of regional tensions, to de-escalating conflict, to rebuilding the bonds between nations, to collectively putting an end to terrorism and extremism, and to investing in economic and human development. We want a stable and secure Arabian Peninsula and Middle East, so that we and our neighbors can invest in building up our nations, not tearing them down, to have a brighter future for generations to come. Our goal is to bring economic, social, and cultural, cultural transformation to Saudi Arabia at a pace and a scale all but matched in unmodern history. Through our leadership's national transformation initiative called 2030, Saudi Arabia has already invested hundreds of billions to diversify our economy as we transform the kingdom into a regional and global engine for economic growth. We are creating a high-tech next generation economy building sustainable cities for, of the future, opening our doors to tourism, creating opportunities for and empowering Saudi women and youth. We believe that the success of Vision 2030 will not only improve the quality of life and opportunities for the people of Saudi Arabia, but will also contribute to the prosperity of the region. It will represent a promising model for development in an area of the world where ideologies of extremism and chaos compete for the region's future. We could do even more if our region were more secure and if our neighbors were all equally committed to de-escalating tensions, politically resolving, uh, resolving disagreements and investing in our people instead of advancing expansionist ambitions. Our approach to the region and the world is to create stability, opportunity and economic growth through inclusion, cooperation and multilateralism. For example, Saudi Arabia played a central role in reaching peace agreements between countries in the Horn of Africa, and we have and continue to support Sudan's peaceful transition. But in stark contrast, Iran maintains a single-minded focus on undermining the health and safety of nations and communities, openly supporting terrorist groups, terrorist proxies, armed militias, and murderous regimes, interjecting itself wherever it can to create chaos and instability as it has done in so many places like Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and as far away as South America. It seems wherever there has trouble in the region, you find Iran. The policies of the Iranian regime and its proxies lead to the political and humanitarian crisis firmly grasping our neighbor Yemen. The crisis is entirely the product of Houthi obstructionism and the Iranian intervention, callousness, and hostility. Iran and its Houthi proxies undermine peace and stability in Yemen, which led to the breakdown of its civil society and the resulting despair of the Yemeni people. Iran sacrificed the well-being of the people of Yemen to create an area of mayhem and lawlessness to use as a launching pad for extremism that endangers not just Saudi Arabia, but the entire region and the world. Together with our Arab coalition and international partners, we are committed to restoring the legitimate government of Yemen. And with the United Nations, we continue to seek a peaceful resolution a negotiated settlement, but Iran and the Houthis are not interested. Every time there is potential progress, they walk away. Every time we take steps forward, like the coalition's recent unilateral ceasefire, those steps are rejected. How did Iran and the Houthis respond to our ceasefire? A space, uh, a space we created for people, for possible talks, they responded with drones and ballistic missiles attacks. Saudi Arabia and the coalition will not abandon the people of Yemen, nor can we ignore the security and defense of our nation and our people, which have been threatened by more than 300 ballistic missile attacks on our soil. And we cannot ignore the potential future threat of an Iran armed with nuclear weapons and the continued exports of its revolutionary agenda through hostile and terrorist behavior. Our partnership with the United States is critical in addressing Iran's malign behavior, and we are committed to working with the US so that Iran does not obtain a nuclear bomb. 
ever, as well as ending the Iranian regime's policies and practices of interference and destabilization. We have always extended a hand of peace to Iran. We've had security agreements with them before. We have invited Iranian President to Riyadh and even welcomed the JCPOA. But as we interpret these as steps towards security, Iran interprets them as opportunities for expansionism. That is why we believe uh, the continuation of maximum pressure is the only way to reach a reliable, enduring agreement, which will ensure that Iran forever abandons its nuclear weapons ambition and ceases to meddle in the affairs of other countries through, destabiliz through destabilization and acts of terrorism. This is part of our vision for the peace and security of the region, one that includes the greatest Middle East as well. The kingdom has always been at the forefront of efforts to bring peace and security to the Middle East and to secure a just and comprehensive resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Over the years, Saudi Arabia has put forward peace proposals created to achieve and protect the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people and the security of the people of Israel and Palestine. That has been and remains our goal. And we continue to work with our partners to find a lasting peaceful resolution. And so we welcome the recent efforts to bring the parties together towards a comprehensive peace plan, because an important step in securing regional stability in the Middle East remains a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. All other things will follow from that. And that is possible if we continue to talk to come together with a common goal of settlement that works for all parties. But negotiation require partners on both sides of the table. Settlement can only occur when there are partners in the process, partners willing to talk in good faith, putting some interests aside and committed to the fundamental health and security of all parties. What has kept our relationship, the eight decade partnership between the kingdom and the United States durable and strong is a mutual mission to bring people and nations together, to value above all else, peace and security, and to prefer and always seek negotiation, mediation and diplomacy. Yes, there are times when we see things differently. That's to be expected. But despite those occasional divergences, what matters most is that our relationship remains strong. That we continue to build on the foundations that are put in place by two leaders who didn't know each other well, but knew then that our partnership could be important to the world, uh, the world's way forward following the Second World War. And now, our alliance goes much deeper than just one king or one president. It's not partisan or political. It's about the best interests of both nations. Each year, more than 40,000 Saudi students study at US colleges and universities, bringing our communities and people closer together, helping us to know each other, building bridges and bonds that keep our national friendships strong outside the hallways and corridors of Washington, DC. And during this pandemic, Many of these students, instead of returning to the kingdom, stayed in their U.S. communities, medical students and others working on the front lines, because at the end of the day, that is what is most important about our partnership, working together in difficult times in the face of daunting challenges, but never giving up and always committed to the more secure and safe world that our leaders first imagined. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak uh, with you today, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your opening remarks. Um, you, uh, you laid the table for quite a number of issues that uh, we can discuss in, in our conversation. And I've received, uh, already begun to receive quite a long list of questions. Um, again, if you want to contact me, uh, contact me at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org with your queries for the foreign minister. Um, let's begin, if we can, with the first regional topic that, uh, that you raised in your remarks. Um, uh, which is the situation on the Arabian Peninsula, the situation in the war with Yemen. You said in your closing remarks, uh, Saudi Arabia will always seek diplomacy. Um, you say you, you're looking for a political solution to end the war. Um, how do you get there now? What is your plan to end the war? Do you need the Houthis to give up their relationship with Iran to do that? What would that look like? Or is there something else, some other major trigger that will allow this war to come to a close? I think uh, the first step that we need is for the Houthis to sign on to a joint declaration of a ceasefire. The UN representative has been trying for the last several months very hard to convince the Houthis to uh, join uh, what the coalition has already announced, which is a cessation of uh, its military activities. And uh, if that uh, takes place, I think that lays the groundwork for a, a political process. And we've always said that the Houthis 
have a place in the political framework of Yemen. Uh, what we need is for them to give up their weapons and to focus on building Yemen through participating in the political process rather than trying to impose their will by force. So I, uh, I hope that they will take up the opportunity, that they will uh, agree to a joint declaration of a ceasefire, that they will join a political process and engage with the government of Yemen and the other interested parties within the Yemeni framework, and we will support all efforts to reach a political resolution. And do you think this can be done while the Houthis maintain the relationship they have with Iran, or does Iran need to alter its view of what its interests are in terms of the conflict in Yemen? I think Iran wants the conflict to go on, and that's why it continues to supply the Houthis with extensive weaponry, including ballistic missiles, drones, and other equipment that helps them target not just the forces of the government of Yemen, but also civilian targets in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Our argument to the Houthis is that they need to focus on being a part of Yemen and on working towards the interests of the Yemeni people. They should not be a tool in the hands of Iran, and they should not work to the uh, interests of Iran. Once they decide that they are focused on the best interests of Yemen and its people, I think finding a path forward will be easy. So I, I think you, you quite rightly and accurately referred to the, um, uh, the ballistic missile attacks um, against Saudi civilian targets. Um, a recent UN panel of experts report on Yemen accused all parties of indiscriminate attacks. Uh, the experts also said that Saudi-led airstrikes continue to disregard the principles of proportionality and precautions to protect citizens. Now, we're five years into this war. Um, uh, uh, the, I, the argument that one often hears, you know, mistakes will, will, will happen. Why are these reports of indiscriminate attacks still coming out, even from your side of, uh, um, of the battlefield? So I haven't seen uh, the specific report you just referenced, but I will say that we take any uh, accusation of uh, damage or uh, targeting of civilian targets very, very seriously, and they are investigated. We have a process to investigate those allegations, and when we find uh, any cause to believe they are true, we are openly uh, willing to admit that and hold uh, uh, the necessary process within our internal uh, structures to hold those accountable. So I think it's important to, to understand that we take this issue very, very seriously, and we are committed to minimizing any uh, risk to civilians in the battle space. Have you found any uh, uh, evidence of indiscriminate uh, uh, disproportionate attack? We have never, no intentional indiscriminate uh, attacks by the coalition uh, have taken place, but there are, as you referred to, errors in war. I mean, we have seen this uh, in many conflicts, even modern conflicts in which other nations have taken part, war is a complex uh, environment, especially in a place like Yemen. So there will be uh, errors and we are striving and working very hard. And I think the numbers will show that uh, uh, there is significant effort by the coalition to minimize uh, damage to civilian targets. Um, I'd like to move to a different topic. Uh, quite a few questions on this. Um, now, I know you're, you're obviously here during a political season. Um, uh, the Democratic candidate, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, issued a statement uh, very recently on the anniversary of the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. And I just want to read a couple of sentences from this statement. Uh, Jamal Khashoggi and his loved ones deserve accountability. Under a Biden-Harris administration, we will reassess our relationship with the kingdom end U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen and make sure America does not check its values at the door to sell arms or buy oil. Um, I'm not, not going to ask you to comment on the partisanship or on the um, uh, one candidate or the other, but this statement does raise two questions that I do want to ask you. First, the concept of accountability. Uh, some spokesmen for your government have said the judicial proceedings um, for the Khashoggi killing are over. Yet many Americans, both Republicans and Democrats, say they are still looking for accountability for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. How will your government meet these demands for accountability? What's legitimate to demand in your view and what's not legitimate to demand? 
So, uh, I mean, you're right, I'm not going to wade into the political uh, sphere in the US, it's not my place, but I will say that I uh, I do agree with uh, uh, candidate Biden, Vice President Biden. The killing of Jamal Khashoggi was an abhorrent act, a terrible act, a terrible crime, and we have stated that uh, quite strongly. Uh, it, we have taken uh, very uh, active measures to uh, hold those responsible accountable. You, you talk about accountability. Accountability on a state level is mainly about ensuring that uh, things like this cannot happen again. And that's something that the leadership has clearly indicated we're committed to. We're committed to building in the safeguards and security and, and processes in our security services to ensure that something like this cannot happen again, that there is the necessary oversight, the necessary controls in place, that we can ensure that uh, uh, these kinds of things and these kinds of activities don't go on. And I think that is the responsibility, the prime responsibility of state. And that's how states can be held accountable. They must ensure that uh, their uh, relevant organs uh, behave responsibly, and we are committed to doing that. So is it fair to say just on this point that in your view, the government of uh, Saudi Arabia has projected its commitment to accountability and it is now essentially concluded with, uh, with this issue? Uh, so I will say that, uh, you know, the Crown Prince himself has said that we uh, that there is a political responsibility in the state. And this is, of course, the case. Uh, is this the end of the issue? No, because the process that we have instituted to reform our security service and to instill the necessary safeguards is something that we will have to keep going at. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, it is a process that needs to be constantly monitored and that we need to hold ourselves accountable. And we will do that. I mean, we are very much committed to this as a ongoing process. It's not something that we just want to sweep off the rug. This is not the case. We uh, are very much in, in, in the mindset that we cannot allow something like this to ever happen again. The second piece of what uh, the vice president said was to raise the concept of a reassessment. As the term has uh, a long diplomatic history in the United States. Um, uh, uh, many Americans, again, not solely Democrats. I think there's some on on, uh, of, of all political persuasions, uh, have reached the conclusion that perhaps the U.S.-Saudi relationship that has come to develop over the 75 years um, uh, is untenable in its current terms. Um, uh, how would your government respond to the argument that it needs a reset, a reassessment, and what would be the terms, in your view, that would be appropriate for that sort of uh, reassessment? So I'm uh, here uh, today and the, uh, this week uh, to be part of the strategic dialogue between the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the thing that I've seen uh, during that dialogue is that the relationship is still very relevant, very strong. The issues of joint interest and cooperation are extensive. They go far beyond the traditional uh, aspects that we think of of just counterterrorism. There are many, many more issues where we work together very closely and we have a strong alignment both in regional policies but also in our outlook to the global multilateral order. I think that any assessment uh, that is done of the relationship will find that there is still very, very significant value for both countries for the, and both peoples in the relationship. And I am confident that uh, any administration will see the very, very strong and important uh, value that is in that relationship. And we will work with any uh, administration to uh, further those interests and work together to deliver uh, all the potential that is in that in this very important relationship. So, if you don't mind me asking, why are we starting? Why are you starting a strategic dialogue uh, in the uh, you know two weeks before an American election, three years after President Trump um, uh, visited uh, Riyadh? Well, I mean, the strategic dialogue is an institutional dialogue. It's a dialogue with the United States of America. And therefore, I think it should be completely devoid of a political context. And that's the way we see it. We see this relationship as long lasting. It has lasted for 75 years. It has gone through a lot in those 75 years, but it has continued to deliver strong value. And I think the strategic value, uh, the, uh, the strategic dialogue we're having uh, today and we had yesterday will show that that value will persist into the future. Um, let me ask about another domestic issue, another issue that is high on the minds of uh, many viewers of, of this show, but, but more generally, I think is also something that has uh, attracted uh, considerable attention both sides of the aisle in, uh, in, uh, on Capitol Hill and in American politics. And that's a broader question of human rights issues inside the kingdom. I think it's, it's perhaps one of the largest points of bipartisan agreement 
um, about uh, um, uh, uh, the need for reform in, in Saudi Arabia um, uh, needs to focus on human rights issues. Um, uh, let me ask you specifically about the continuing detention of uh, uh, Lujain al Hathloul and numerous other women, uh, many of whom were activists arrested uh, um, uh, in the weeks before the ban on women's driving was lifted um, two years ago. Very difficult for Americans to understand um, why uh, these women are still in jail. Um, uh, why are they still in jail and when will they be released? So human rights is something that I think we all see as very important. And uh, the kingdom is the same. The leadership of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia sees that importance uh, equally. And we are uh, constantly working on improving the human rights situation and the, uh, the reform process that's ongoing in the kingdom has delivered significant uh, progress in those areas. And uh, I think many people will attest to the fact that whether it's in judicial reform related to issues like flogging or uh, application of the death penalty or whether it's uh, related to uh, the uh, uh, role of the women and uh, role of women in society and far beyond that, you know, the work is ongoing. It is something we do because the leadership believes strongly that it's in the best interest of our country and our people. And as far as uh, the individuals you mentioned, uh, they are not detained because of any human rights activity or activities related to uh, uh, you know, women's emancipation or anything. They are uh, charged with serious crimes under our laws and everyone is equally uh, 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 equal under the law in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and if you break the law, you are subject to uh, its uh, precepts. And the prosecutor has said quite clearly that uh, he sees the public prosecutor that he sees serious crimes, and uh, the courts are independent. They will adjudicate and will take uh, the the necessary uh, uh, actions as they see fit. And when will they be released? This is up to the courts, not to the government. So. Is it your view that people around the world who look at these um, uh, cases and see in them a, um, uh, an affront to, to human rights, that they are mistaken? Uh, I think they may not have all the information and that might be uh, something where we have not been able to explain the case uh, completely that uh, that could be the case, but it's not up to us. It's up to the courts. We have independent courts and they must adjudicate uh, that, uh, those uh, charges. Uh, as far as how people perceive them, I think that everybody has the right to perceive things as they uh, uh, understand them. Um, I only underscore this because I know how, a significant, how significant the issue is and will play a significant issue in the development of U.S.-Saudi relations as we go forward. Um, uh, 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 and I, um, I mean, I, I urge as much as possible, as strongly as possible, that these cases be concluded. Um, uh, uh, is there a reason why they're taking so long to, to reach conclusion? I think that's up to the, uh, we'd have to ask the court. I don't have an answer for that. I think the courts take their time and it's important that they review all the evidence that they are presented with in a fair and uh, deliberate manner. Uh, and we hope that they will come to their conclusion soon. All right, let's, um, let's move now to some issues of regional politics that were raised in, uh, in your own opening remarks. Um, uh, you had a pretty tough statement about Iran. Um, and Iran's regional troublemaking. Um, uh, so I'd like to ask you about U.S. policy toward Iran. Um, in broad strokes, we've had two U.S. policies over the last decade. The Obama administration's focus on nuclear issues leading to the JCPOA, which you said Saudi Arabia um, welcomed, um, uh, which made uh, uh, Iran's other malign activities somewhat of a secondary issue and which sought a certain balance in regional terms between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And then came the Trump administration's maximum pressure, which saw a toughening of sanctions, but not the achievement of a better deal with Iran. And other than the killing of Qasem Soleimani, itself a significant act, no significant pushback on Iran's malign regional activities, symbolized by the attack on Saudi oil facilities uh, last year, to which there was no direct response. Seems to me, perhaps Saudi Arabia isn't pleased with either of these two approaches. Neither one has achieved the sorts of regional st uh, stability, has 
um, has put Iran's nuclear program into uh, um, uh, on you know on hold, um, uh, uh, enhanced um, uh, the security of the region. What do you look for for the next administration to do that neither President Trump nor his predecessor succeeded in doing? So I would argue that uh, the maximum pressure campaign, while it hasn't shown a final result yet, is working. Uh, the regime in Iran is less capable uh, in uh, supporting its proxies in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria. Uh, it is certainly feeling the pressure domestically. Uh, it is certainly uh, uh, constrained and contained more than it was in the past. The problem with the JCPOA, as I think it could be understood from your question, was it didn't address any of the malign activities uh, whether it's uh, their regional ambition and their support of proxies, their undermining of state institutions, or the more direct threats of their ballistic missile program and other milita military programs. And our hope is that uh, uh, Iran will accept to sit down uh, with the global community, include, led by the U.S. And, you know, I know this administration has been willing to sit down with Iran, and we fully support that. We, our vision is uh, uh, something like a JCPOA++, a JCPOA that addresses the deficiencies that the, uh, the original document had in non-proliferation, mainly the sunset uh, clauses, uh, but also addresses the issue of ballistic missiles and uh, malign regional activities. I mean, under JCPOA, we would have an expiration of the arms uh, uh, embargo this month. This is really, uh, I mean, uh, boggles the mind how, you know, how we came to that conclusion or we thought that that was uh, reasonable, considering everything that was going on at the time, not least uh, the actions in Syria, the ongoing support for uh, Hezbollah, the ongoing support for the Houthis, and the idea that uh, the Iran would be in such a short time frame getting now access to much more sophisticated weaponry, including uh, equipment that they might use to improve the, uh, uh, the accuracy of their ballistic missiles, etc., uh, is... Uh, uh, really uh, dangerous. You mentioned uh, pushback. I think w w the U.S. and others are pushing back very, uh, we, with our support, are pushing back very hard. But you know, our belief is we don't want a military confrontation. So we don't want military uh, uh, confrontation between the U.S. and Iran or between us and Iran. It's Iran that uh, occasionally lashes out militarily and seeks confrontation. We want pressure that leads to talks. And we hope that the Iranians will choose that path rather than uh, uh, leashing out uh, with uh, uh, their uh, uh, military or with their ballistic missiles or with their proxies and uh, other activities. I think uh, the path for peace is open. They just need to take it. And so is it your view that um, uh, uh, that the Trump administration has, um, uh, uh, has set the table um, uh, for uh, an aggressive pursuit of, quote, a better deal, JCPOA++? plus plus? As the administration laid out to you, it's its strategy to achieve this plus plus deal. I think so. I think, uh, as we said, if we continue to put uh, significant pressure on uh, Iran and uh, on the Iranian regime, that will force them eventually to come to the table. Uh, and uh, I believe that everybody now sees that without addressing the deficiencies of the original agreement, any uh, future agreement, whether it's called JCPOA, whether it's called something else. Uh, will only lay the groundwork for future instability. So it'll, it'll be a temporary salve that will not deliver the security that we need and that we all hope for in the region. And in, in the meantime, most uh, many uh, observers note that the Iranians are, are pursuing enrichment at a pace which violates, of course, the JCPOA limits, but which brings them um, frighteningly close to achieving a nuclear weapons capability. Um, uh, uh, does this, I mean, how does this concern you? What do you think the answer to this is? It concerns us gravely. We are, uh, of course, uh, very, very you know, worried about the Iranians' intentions. We have always been suspicious of their intentions. We uh, uh, supported JCPOA, but we supported it grudgingly uh, because we were not involved in its formation, forming or consulted about it. Uh, you know, so we hoped that it would deliver the best while we were very suspicious of the potential. Uh, and as I said, you know, we had sunset built into that, that we felt very strongly that eventually, once Iran was able to rebuild its economic uh, capacity uh, and uh, therefore have a much larger, uh, much more robust resilience towards future sanctions, they would potentially have uh, headed to broke out anyway. So we think 
uh, uh, while there is a danger and a risk in the current uh, uh, Iranian regime's activities, that is uh, something that we need to face and confront head on, rather than pretend that the regime, uh, just because it signed on JSBA, had given up on its nuclear ambitions for the long term. We think that they had just uh, put them on the shelf for a temporary period. And uh, just the last question on this, um, as, a, as an observer of, of, of Iran, do you think the, the, the amount of pressure being imposed on them is, is close to the point where the Iranians are going to say, enough, let's negotiate, or is this going to go on for quite some time? It appears to us that they are under significant pressure. How much they can uh, continue to last is, of course, something this is a hypothetical I can't make a guess at. What we hope is that they will uh, change their focus. They should focus on delivering peace and prosperity uh, and development for the Iranian people. If they just change that focus, I think everything else will flow from that. And otherwise, I, uh, unfortunately, the only option and the only uh, viable uh, safeguard for the region is to keep the pressure on. Um, I'd like to turn to another issue that you raised in your in your talk, and that concerned uh, um, uh, the Arab-Israeli peace process. Um, uh, reading between the lines, um, uh, you know, I've spent too many years focusing on this. Reading between the lines of your remarks, you said, I believe, that uh, you know all all these things about progress will follow from a Palestinian-Israeli agreement, which sounded like a reaffirmation of the Arab peace initiative. Um, uh, whose basic principle is um, uh, all Arab and, and Muslim majority states will make full peace with Israel uh, the day after, essentially, the day after uh, of, uh, an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement, which a, a model which has been, uh, shall we say, challenged by recent events of uh, the UAE and the Bahrain um, uh, agreements to have full normal relations with Israel. Um, now, your government has taken some steps. It has congratulated and welcomed these other um, countries' moves, permitting overflights um, uh, between those countries and Israel. Um, can you imagine more incremental steps down that path as an interim stage w before a final peace arrangement? Are there, are there more interim steps like that to be had? I believe that the focus now needs to be on getting the Palestinians and the Israelis back to the negotiating table. Uh, in the end, the only thing that can deliver lasting uh, peace uh, and lasting stability uh, is an agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis. If we don't manage to achieve that, we will continue to have that festering wound uh, in, in the region. We are committed to the uh, uh, process of peace. Peace we see is a strategic necessity for the region. Uh, part of that is an eventual normalization with Israel, as envisioned in the Arab peace plan, as envisioned even in uh, what the kingdom uh, uh, proposed in 1981 in Fez. So we have always envisioned that uh, a normalization would happen. But we also need to have a Palestinian state and we need to have a Palestinian and Israeli peace plan. Therefore, we strongly believe that the focus now should be on getting the Palestinians and the Israelis to the table. And I believe, uh, you know, everybody is committed to trying to find a way to achieve that. And um, is it your view that uh, the Emiratis and Bahrainis made that more likely or less likely by the steps that they've taken with Israel? So the uh, Emirati and the Bahraini uh, deal, uh, one of the things they delivered is taking annexation uh, at, at least uh, off the table for the time being, which was a significant threat to the prospects for peace. So then that, uh, uh, you know, if you look at it from that context, it does help uh, lay the groundwork for potentially uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians getting back to the table. More work needs to be done, but you can look at it as a positive in that context. Would you welcome other Arab states, if not Saudi Arabia, um, taking those sorts of steps, that is, um, uh, moving toward normal relations with Israel in exchange for Israel taking certain measures uh, with the Palestinians? Uh, the states will have to decide what they think is in the best interest of them and uh, the cause that they believe in. Can I ask you about a, about a fascinating set of interviews that were delivered um, just recently by um, uh, uh, Prince Bandar, 
um, uh, uh, who speaks with some authority given his personal experience on these issues. Um, uh, I believe it's fair to say that one can sum up the um, uh, Prince Bandar's interview with the phrase, the Palestinian cause is just, but Palestinian leaders have failed their people repeatedly. Do you agree? Uh, that's Prince Mandel's opinion. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the Palestinian leaders genuinely want what's best for their people. Uh, the important thing is to work with them and the Israelis to get talks going. And that's what we're committed to. Okay. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left. There are a couple of more big topics that people are flooding my email box with. Um, the rift inside the Gulf Cooperation Council, um, the rift between you and Qatar. Um, this has been going on now for three years, uh, more than three years. Um, what are the specific requirements that your government has to end this? Are they still the 13 demands that were put down three years ago? Or is that, shall we say, an opening bargaining position? And, uh, you know, cooler heads can prevail and find a solution. I certainly hope that cooler heads will prevail uh, in, 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 and find a solution. I believe that we are committed to finding a solution. We are, uh, you know, we from the beginning, we've worked uh, with uh, the late Emir of Kuwait to find a path forward. We continue to be willing to engage uh, with our uh, Qatari brothers, and we hope that they are as committed to that engagement. And if we are able to find a path forward to address the legitimate security concerns of the quartet, uh, that drove us to take the decisions we took. Uh, that will be uh, good news for the region. It will be good news, uh, I think, for the uh, for stability and security. But we do need to address the legitimate security concerns of the quartet. And I think there is a path towards that, and we are hoping that we can find uh, that in the relatively near future. When do you think uh, this will will see this Gulf Rift resolved? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I hope your guess is better than mine. Um, you referenced in your remarks Vision 2030. This has captured quite a bit of attention um, uh, for some of the dramatic uh, um, aspirations that the kingdom has, uh, has uh, uh, identified for uh, reform, economic, social, um, other reform inside the kingdom. Um, uh, without, uh, without giving the full brief, what's on target and what's not on target? in terms of uh, achieving the objectives here? So broadly, Vision 2030 uh, is on target. Of course, uh, we have all in the global community been challenged by COVID-19. COVID-19 has put an enormous strain uh, economically, socially, in all contexts on uh, governments around the world. And uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is not, has not been immune from that. So that has affected. So before COVID-19 hit, we were, for instance, on track to record low unemployment among, Saudi, uh, among Saudis. That has, of course, uh, uh, now been uh, affected significantly because of the economic impact of uh, COVID-19. But uh, on the positive side, we are among the least affected G20 nations by the downturn uh, caused by the pandemic. So our GDP loss is significantly lower than many of our G uh, G20 partners. Uh, there are many things that continue to be on track. For instance, home ownership by Saudis is at record highs. Uh, uh, other uh, uh, deliverables such as women's empowerment, women uh, participation in the workforce are, you know, uh, are ahead of target, for instance. So you have some issues there where we are ahead of target, quality of life issues uh, uh, are uh, progressing very, very strongly. The uh, larger um, uh, mega projects, as they are called, of course, will uh, be later to show their results, but they continue to be uh, uh, on target as far as their development processes. And uh, we have been committed to insulating them as much as possible from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic economically. Uh, broadly, Vision 2030 is on track. Uh, it is, of course, affected by uh, uh, with the global economic crisis, as I said. Uh, and I think once we are over uh, uh, the uh, 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 the most severe impacts of the uh, of the pandemic, we will be able to ramp up very quickly to deliver on the targets that are set. But Vision 2030, by the way, uh, was designed and built to be a flexible 
vision in the sense that it should be able to uh, deal very effectively and efficiently with uh, uh, shocks and with uh, surprises. And that's the case. We've been able to re reallocate resources as necessary to make sure that uh, those things that are um, of highest priority are protected uh, and continue to go forward. And if I could ask, how has the continuing low price of, uh, of oil affected all this? My, my assumption is that uh, um, uh, the uh, short-term needs uh, for spending to enable these reforms are uh, pretty great but uh, the global economy is not, uh, is not playing along. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, all of our economies, uh, you know, we are a global community and all of our economies have been affected by this global pandemic. Uh, Saudi Arabia has not been immune and we have, uh, of course, taken a hit. Uh, the oil price uh, is not where we, you know, we're not in an ideal place. But we've, we had enough reserves and we had enough borrowing capacity that we were able to not only keep the most important parts of Vision 20 on track, but also to inject significant stimulus into uh, the domestic economy to make sure that uh, the, uh, uh, the economy is protected from the worst effects of the pandemic. So uh, Saudi Arabia is still uh, uh, very in a very strong financial position, even with all the, uh, all the challenges of the economic downturn and with the downturn in the oil price. We have a lot of re uh, resilience built into the system, and we are taking advantage of that now. Okay, we'll just... One, one last question. Uh, you're heading back to, uh, to Riyadh. Uh, you came here um, uh, at an extraordinary moment in, in American politics. Um, uh, just between the two of us, um, when, uh, um, when your uh, uh, superiors say, Prince Faisal, tell me, where is America today? What did you, what did you glean from your time in Washington, your time in America? Um, what's your report? So between me, you, and 2,000 of our best friends, uh, I, I will report that, uh, uh, that America is a robust democracy going through a very interesting process uh, that bears watching, and, uh, you know, we will watch it. <laughs> and those are the words of a foreign minister. Um, uh, foreign minister, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, um, uh, you uh, answering the broad range of questions that I posed, and I look forward to, um, uh, to more opportunities um, to have a uh, continuing discussion with you and your colleagues about uh, the direction of U.S.-Saudi relations. So thank you very much for being with us today at the Washington Institute. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.